You will go down the Brock Road a hundred yards, and the Gazarban Road goes off to the south and west, and the Brock Road, which we're going to leave here on, continues to the southeast. Todd's Tavern was located over the area where we have the trees. The painting is by Frankenstein, period. It is not the Baron of the Monster Store. <laughs> no, this one's a famous item. It's Tavern. Uh, Frank is briefed, uh, not only is it, Frank is briefed you folks on the on your bus. It's why uh, the Union Army has made its decision to push on. The Union have been in occupation of Todd's Tavern uh, since the uh, since the fifth uh, since the uh, the fifth day of. May. They're familiar with it. The cavalry is supposed to be very familiar with God's Tavern. <laughs> and as we've said, this is a key point on the march for the Federals. We have been traveling, as you know, in a bus with General Hancock, with General Warren and the Fifth Corps with General Meade and Grant and their staffs. On the way to and traveling on roads parallel to us and to the west of us, which we cannot travel on because it's no longer passable, would be that road along a road that had been opened by under the supervision of William Nelson Pendleton on the Pioneer of the Pioneers on the evening of the uh, of the beginning on the more uh, early hour, on the late hours of the sixth all through the seventh uh, was this road leading from the unfinished railroad grade from Todd's Tavern and turning in to the Catharpin Road two miles west of us and a half a mile short of the, bri the Corbin Bridge which carries the uh, Catharpin Road across the Bow River and on to Shady Grove Church where it intersects the, e the, the uh, where, uh, where it intersects the the Shady Grove Church Road leading across the Poe River at Blockhouse Bridge. Now, Frank will go into uh, more detail, I'm sure, on uh, what the Confederates are doing. Now, when the Union vanguard of General Warren reaches here at 11 p.m. on the evening of the, of the 7th, Warren's timetable is to have his men at Spotsylvania Courthouse by, day, by daybreak on the 8th day of May. According to the orders issued by General Humphreys to General, through General Sheridan. Sheridan is to have most of two divisions of cavalry here. The division commanded by General Merritt and the division commanded by David Mercury Gregg. Gregg's men had been here since early on the 5th. In fact, they had been engaged in skirmishing with Wade Hampton's cavalry west of us toward and beyond the Po River. So in theory, the cavalry should have known this area well. 
and Warren gets here with his vanguard at 11 p.m. Right on schedule. And the cavalry is not ready to move. So Warren will have to delay one and one half hours. Frank and I have pretty well made it that Warren has trouble controlling his emotions. And it is going after a delay of an hour and a half, and Meade will be here by this time. And his staff, and not only Meade is chopping at the bit. Because the cavalry will not move out, and when they do, Greg will move out on the Catharpin Road. And not move out far enough. If he'd gone another mile out the Catharpin Road, he would have run in to General Anderson as he comes down the open road and turns to the west and southwest. General, General Barrett will have the privilege of leading the march to Spotsylvania Courthouse. Now the other Union Division of Cavalry, under Harry Wilson, who was probably most familiar with this area, since Harry had been operating on the Catharpin Road uh, since the fifth day of May, he has taken a series of roads, including the uh, Catharpin Road, the Orange uh, Plank Road, and he is thundering down the Fredericksburg uh, Spotsylvania Turnpike, heading for Spotsylvania Courthouse, and he will be there. At, he's the only Yankee that's going to be in Spotsylvania Courthouse, and it will be at uh, about daybreak but he ain't gonna stay there long. So the Union plan is beginning to run into some troubles here, and uh, we will be doing their troubles. They're going to be running in when we do the march. And now I turn it over to General Dick Anderson. <laughs> he got, he's a man of many personalities. Wow. Thank God I don't have to pay all their taxes. <laughs> <laughs> All right. That has given you a rather troubling scenario. We have talked about Warren being here. We have talked about Meade being here. We have talked about Union Cavalry being here. Who have we not talked about being here? Well, this isn't a spot that Grant should be in. Who should be here? Sheridan. 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 Oh. We haven't talked about him being here at all. That should trouble you. As it is, Confederate cavalry has been holding this ground on May 7th. They've been in this intersection watching, observing the road to the north. And Sheridan's cavalry emerged as the vanguard of the Union advance out of the wilderness. They need to secure this intersection to open the road south. They attack the Confederates at Todd's Tavern from the north, from the east, and drive the Confederates to the west and to the south. Fitzhugh Lee, Robert E. Lee's nephew, is going to put up a tenacious rear guard as he fights his way down the Brock Road to Spotsylvania Courthouse, constantly challenging the Union advance to prod them to give him more information. As far as he is concerned, the only thing he has seen and encountered on this road is Union cavalry. Where is the Union army? Is it behind the cavalry? Is this a vanguard 
Or is this a rear guard? Masking a retreat. So he challenges them, he engages them. Sheridan has a great deal of force and will habitually push him back to the very cusp of Spotsylvania Courthouse. Not only is Todd's Tavern secured, the entire road south is secure. Sheridan's cavalry has done an admirable job. They have denied the Confederates a chance to know what's behind them, and they have taken their objective for the day. So as the day ends, Sheridan is going to order all of his cavalry back here to Todd's Tavern. All the ground we have captured, we are going to give it up and fall back to here. Fitzhugh Lee is amazed and will double back. And all the ground we fought over on May 7th, we're going to have to fight over it again on May 8th. But back to the question, the paralysis here is not only that Fitzhugh Lee is blocking the road below us, but the Union Cavalry is blocking the road right in our midst as they bivouac here. Where is Phil? The loathsome little psychopath isn't here. <laughs> so we've just done a transition on Marshall from being Harry Wilson to being Sheriff. <laughs> all the people I've been all the years for you, the one I won't be is Phil Sheridan. <laughs> Butler's okay, Sheridan no. Tell me he doesn't get a vote. Gosh, even Earl Van Dorn had some ethics. <laughs> oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. That's a zero. Sheridan isn't here. Sheridan has gone back to his headquarters at the All Ridge Farm, well off to the east of us. He has left no forwarding orders. So the men are sitting here when the Union Army vanguard arrives. When George Meade finds paralysis and no Corps commander, he asserts his authority over his own troops and orders them to clear this road. So the cavalry is in motion because of George Gordon Meade. Robert E. Lee is in an unenviable position where he has had to shake up his hierarchy. And in the first 48 hours of combat has been an army commander, a wing commander, and a corps commander. George Meade shares his pain. He is an army commander, he is a chief of staff to the general in chief of the army, and now he is also his own cavalry commander. Sheridan's debut is awful. A man who doesn't know his role, doesn't even know his objectives, seizes his objectives and then surrenders them, and then wanders off into an irrelevant backwash where nobody can find him, communicate with him, and impart orders or have him impart those orders to the cavalry. Sheridan <coughs> is a failure. And that failure is going to cost the Union Army in excess of 18,000 casualties. That failure is going to make sure that the Union Army is going to have to fight and struggle and dig for everything they're worth to get down this road, to get to Spotsylvania, a goal they will never achieve because the Confederates will beat them there. We are engaged in an unwitting foot race from here on out, a foot race that the Confederates, as well as the Union, are oblivious to but a foot race that the Confederates will win simply because the Union advance stops here and waits for hours. And then when they finally push out, 
we are going to start fighting around the bend and non-stop from here on out. That will cost time, that will cost lives, and that will give the Confederates a chance to make Spotsylvania Courthouse untouchable. Harry Wilson will be there alone, behind the Confederate line. And he will prudently fall back when he knows his isolation. From that point on out, we are going to be stuck fighting in trench warfare, fighting in another ugly stalemate. The Union Army is tantalizingly close to being ahead of the Confederates to interject their forces between Lee to the west and Lee's capital to the south. And Phil Sheridan is the fellow who threw it all away. Miserable Cretan. <laughs> you think that's bad? Imagine what my position is, knowing that Phil Sheridan has my back. <laughs> <laughs> Do you ever get tired at this abuse, Mark? Never. <laughs> we know a good lawyer can defend you right behind you. That's an oxymoron. There's no such thing. <laughs> I resent that oxy part. <laughs> and you're going to, we'll, we'll go on our buses since we want to be in the battlefield. We'll hear whose side Grant is going to take. Uh, that night, uh, and it's not General Lee. Uh -huh. <laughs> Marshall has friends in high places, huh? <laughs> <laughs> Any questions before we move on? Yes. How does uh, Wilson get to uh, Buck's Bay Court? What's his route? Where's he at? Can't hear the question. Uh, the question is, how does Wilson get to Spotsylvania Courthouse from here? James Harrison Wilson, the question is, how does he get from here, from here over to Spotsylvania Courthouse? He's going to go in a very roundabout manner. He's going to leave the wilderness and go east through Chancellorsville, then cut cross country and cap, uh, catch on to the uh, courthouse road between Fredericksburg and Spotsylvania move down the courthouse road into Spotsylvania Courthouse itself. By that point, Confederate infantry is already fighting on the Brock Road. Uh, he will set up some artillery in the courthouse, shell the Confederates from behind, in a sense, advertising that he is stuck in their rear. Uh, they divert a couple of brigades of infantry to shoo him back out. Looking at a couple brigades of infantry versus a couple brigades of cavalry, Harry Wilson does the prudent thing and falls back. Though he holds the goal, the objective, he doesn't have the means to hold it indefinitely and certainly not long enough for the Union Army to break through and come to him. He is deep in the rear with no likely chance of anyone coming to his rescue. Not even Burnside if they'd really hustled him along. I want you to think about those words. <laughs> <laughs> Burnside isn't going to get into that road until the night. I got a question. Uh, while the Union guys were marching along this road, were they totally unaware that the Confederate Army was moving on a parallel road at the same time? Well, they have, they have a, they have an opinion because Grant and me were Grant out in front with his staff, followed by me and his staff, when they come to the Y, where you saw the sign, Jackson's flank march. Grant comes to that line, or that intersection. And instead of taking the Brock Road, he goes down the wood road that Jackson had used on his flank march. As he and his staff, followed by me and his staff, are riding on that road, they hear men moving to the west.
They know that it isn't there. They know, Grant knows, that somebody is out there. So what does he do? He turns around, because he has a phobia against turning back, rides back to the intersection, and then comes down. So yes, Grant and me know somebody is out there, uh, and uh, is moving on that road, because if they had continued riding the way they were, uh, Grant and Meade would not be uh, non-relevant the rest of the war. So, uh, uh, so they know they're moving. Uh, again, the cavalry is uh, not ready to move. And when Greg goes out there, they do not say, because Meade has to deal with Greg, uh, he has to, and Greg has been here. So he's going to tell Greg to go out there and guard the Catharpin Road. But he doesn't go out far enough uh, to reach the point where the road that General Pendleton has opened debouches into the Catharpin Road. So yes, there are people out there, uh, but they don't go out that far. Uh, maybe if Sheridan was not at Alsop, maybe he could go out there with him and uh, use Marshall Froelich as a scout and have them see <laughs> Now, as a corollary to that, the Federals are aware of a movement. They don't know its nature. The Confederates are aware of a movement. They don't know its nature. The Confederates are aware that there is a Federal presence on this road. Sheridan has made that painfully obvious. What it means or how much significance is behind it, it's hard to determine in the early hours. When the Confederates moved to Spotsylvania Courthouse, they assumed that they could not only move through a series of makeshift roads and paths in the Shady Grove Church to the west, but they were also hoping that Jubilee could be able to access this road through Todd's Tavern and go down to Spotsylvania Courthouse. As the Union Army presses beyond this point, Winfield Scott Hancock's 2nd Corps is going to be guarding this intersection. If you will, imagine there are two parallel columns and there is one road that bisects them, like the arm in a capital letter H. And that is the Catharpin Road, where you can see the power lines, or the telephone lines, moving off to the west. Hancock is going to sit here on the eastern arm or leg of the uh, H and guard this beam to make sure no one comes into their flank or rear. <clears throat> David McMurtry Gregg is out there not far enough, clearly. Jubilee's men are going to challenge it. Wade Hampton's cavalry is going to challenge it and drive it back up here to the tavern. Confederate cavalry is going to charge out into these fields out here in front of you to seize this intersection. What they're going to run into is infantry. And they're going to be blistered and sent back. According to one federal, they were sent into the field cheering and they were sent out of the field howling. The Confederates now know there is a heavy uh, group out here on this road. They know that it's federal infantry after the fact, but they know where the Union Army is. They're not going to access this road. Jubal early diverts back to the west and takes the Shady Grove Church Road. So we've had a couple of battles in this little intersection over the first couple days. We've had a May 5th action here, Harry Williams or, or Harry Wilson. We have had a May 7th action here and then a second May 7th action, or a May 8th action here. So, quite a bit coming on. And Hancock will remain here until the 9th, holding this crossroad. On the 9th, he will leave Miles' brigade behind to continue holding it, and then Hancock will take the route we do, and we'll meet Hancock next time when we're talking about uh, 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 the attack scheduled for the 10th, because on the 9th, Hancock will cross the Pole River uh, to try to turn 
Lee's right. Uh, Turner and Lee's left, and uh, Lee will trump him by sending uh, Uri uh, to cover uh, the Pole River on his extreme left, and then Hancock will uh, be a little delayed, and it'll be very important as what uh, our, our, our Frank said in passing yesterday, Warren is going to have a psychological problem uh, on the uh, on the tenth because Hancock is going to have people are going to be in a bad way recrossing the Po River uh, to reach Laurel Hill and take charge of the attack to be made by the combined corps, and we're going to find out that Warren uh, gets an opportunity of, of after four o'clock. Uh, to launch an attack without Hancock being there, and it's going to get repulsed and screw up every all all the other plans on the uh, departure of uh, of uh, of uh, Upton's attack. If we get it will get delayed. But that's all the attack or not to carry out the attack as ordered. But no one has told him the attack has been delayed to six o'clock. So that's all going to be coming up. So you know this so you Intersection plays an important role. What about the 6th and the 9th Corps? Are they still up there and coming down no, later? The 6th Corps, you've seen it on the map. The 6th Corps uh, marches by way of the or they're, 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 they're moving on the 8th. Uh, they're moving on the 9th and the 7th and 8th. We will see them when they turn in to coming down the Piney Branch Church Road by way of the Brock, uh, by the way of the Catharpin Road, by way of the Orange Plank Road uh, uh, and the uh, Orange Turnpike, uh, they're going to come in and they're going to they're going to be on the field after six o'clock on the eighth. But General Meade has just ordered us to advance. <laughs> Close them up. Proceed. We are have arrived here. We're stand, we have just crossed the Brock Road, and we've come out into this cleared field uh, and a lar uh, of the of a farm, a large farm. <coughs> The Spindle Farm. As you look from here, you can see the ground falls away and then rises up again. Uh, as you can see, the rise of the ground is going to be where we have those uh, uh, rolls of hay. Just to the right of where we can see that vehicle park, to the right of those trees would be the spindle house, two and a half stories high, a frame house that will be set fire during the fighting. This is a large cultivated field that we arrived, arrived in, and we, as we arrive here, we, uh, General Warren will be near the advance. In fact, since they've left the area of the go of uh, between at a point between where the uh, Piney Branch Church Road converges with this uh, with the with the Brock Road and the church, which was not there at the time, on the Gordon Road, the infantry has had to relieve the cavalry because three successive times. The infantry had had to, uh, the, the infantry advance had been stopped by roadblocks. They have had to uh, let the cavalry dismount, break the roadblock, clear the timber, and Fitz Lee is doing a magnificent job of delaying. Now, Warren should have been here by daybreak. It is going to be after 9 o'clock when he arrives here. When he arrives here, he comes out of the woods, there's woods over on the left side of the road. There are woods, and you can see the ground sloping upward, 
and you can see that mass of trees just about on the same alignment then as now. Probably the trees did not come up this uh, near uh, 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 line of trees up that ravine. But he can see that he's right here. The Union Confederate cavalry had arrived some time ahead of him. And they are already throwing, tearing down fences and throwing up fence row barricades while Fitz Lee has kept Anderson, who is resting his command on the far side of the Cold River, because he knows, because he's in contact with me, that he is far ahead of the enemy. If the <laughs> enemy had not had those de delays, be brought up with Union cavalry, he would not have been able to hold. He would not have been <coughs> able to rest his men, let them get their second wind, let them have some, as uh, much some hard tack and bacon, form their inter internal region with awful. But so he's going to be told they're coming and you have to move back. So we'll soon pick up what happens uh, when we switch to the other side of the hill and Frank takes over as Dick Anderson. Because when we arrive here, we can see Confederates up there. Most of them are cavalry, dismounted, uh, planting trees, uh, planting fence rails in a position along just inside that tree line. You can see men up on the high ground between the Y uh, uh, that forms at the head of the hill, the highest ground there. And he realizes it's uh, about 10 minutes too late. Because the Confederate vanguard is arriving and taking position and relieving the cavalry. So Warren is going to decide, I got to attack now. I cannot wait to bring up my, uh, even the second brigade. As they have been for some time, uh, Lyle's brigade has had the advantage. They normally consist of four regiments, but they have been reinforced by the 3rd Maryland, of Denson Brigade, the second line. But he does not have time to deploy. So as each regiment comes up, they're going to de deploy by regimental column. That is not in line of battle. That is with two companies abreast, <coughs> two companies behind them, two companies behind them, two companies behind them. It is a, the, uh, the most, the rapidest way you can. Uh, of course, up here talking with him is John Cleveland Robinson, the division commander. And Robinson decides to encourage the men. He is going forward with Lyle's brigade. And as you can look on the map you're looking at, we're going to switch over to the next map, and you're looking now at map 15. So that means that Lyle's Brigade is going to attack before Denson's Brigade is up, and Coulter is struck out, is not in the area. Coulter has struggled behind, and Lonely, having, having earlier, had to be employed breaking uh, Union roadblocks. So, uh, so uh, Robinson has uh, only two brigades present, but is not going. To, but Dennis Denson is not yet up with his other three regiments. So it's going to be an immediate advance. But unfortunately for him. The lead Confederate infantry with Parker's battery of artillery is on the field, and that is going to be uh, Joe Kershaw's old brigade, uh, five uh, South Carolina regiments and one battalion. Also attached to Kershaw's division is Dunlap's battalion of shock troops. So that means we have been too late. They're going to say, uh, figures like 10 minutes. 
but regardless it's 10 minutes, 12 minutes, 11 minutes, uh, 15 minutes, they are too late. That means the only way we're going to get possession of Laurel Hill and open the road to Spotsylvania is drive the enemy out. It's going to be maybe a half hour before Denson is going to move. And by the time Denson is going to move, move forward to begin his attack, uh, Robinson will have been shot in the right leg. He will be carried to the rear. Uh, he will lose his leg, but he will not return to the service. So some other general can then be the man with the biggest and the most handsome uh, a beard in the Army of the Potomac. But uh, again, to stress the, uh, the, uh, the, uh, the speed with which to go. And meanwhile, uh, poor Harry Wilson has learned the two Confederate brigades, and we will let that, that, that will be uh, Frank Flory since he is General Kershaw's flight, General Anderson, what his men are going to be doing as I turn it over to Frank again. The ground is not outside of moderate erosion that you get from farming. The contour of the land is just the same as it was now. Uh, in the early days when Crick was able to remove timber, he was able to restore that tree line directly in front of us. Uh, if they would remove these other trees here, I'll we'll have to talk to Greg Mertz on it, you can see that that tree line is not in a straight line. It's the historic tree line, and the rear is going to jut forward several 200 yards. And about one, uh, two-thirds of a mile from us, the Confederates are going to have an uh, important physical barrier as more men come up to rest their left flank on. And that is going to be the pole river. So we'll turn it over uh, to whoever who he wants to be. Uh, he may not like General Kershaw, or he may like Anderson more. So he can be who he wants to be. Take over, General. Well, before I take on my Confederate incarnation, whatever it might be, <laughs> one last thought in a, in a federal standpoint. Fifth Corps is taking over the advance here. Warren is going to be here with Lyle. He's going to give him a pep speech, kind of a carrot and stick approach. He's going to tell them flippantly, never mind bullets, never mind cannon. Clear this road. What's the benefit? Then we can have our breakfast. Adding that last part seems to trivialize exactly what we're expecting. But there is a hidden urgency in what Ed has just told us. We are sending one brigade alone forward without support. This is not the Warren of the Wilderness, who has a division that sits for hours at Saunders Field. That was the Warren that got criticized by Grant for being too slow. This is a new Warren. This is a reinvented quarry. Albeit Ed has made a very compelling case of why he needs to move quickly, because we're seeing the scene in front of us rapidly change. But this is also a man who wants to save and redeem his reputation with Brett and me. So he is not going to be slow. He is going to be quick. And in this case, too quick. He will not go forward with the division or the corps. He's going to leave it in the hands of a brigade that is in no position, being a column of regiments, to really do much good. This is a rather futile gesture, if you think about it, regardless of what is out there. So never mind the bullets or the cannon. Press forward and clear this road. What is our objective? as you head across this field. If you are Warren's vanguard, what are you trying to seize? The high ground. Where are the Confederates located on that high ground? 
What kind of protection do they have that we will have to overcome? <clears throat> Trees and trenches. Thank you. Susan is thinking like James Longstreet. <laughs> <laughs> Trees and trenches and defenses. So what is our objective? <clears throat> A tree line. What you guys articulated as the high ground. They're synonymous, aren't they? They're synonymous, aren't they? Yes. Yes, sir. All right. So let's go get our objective. Breakfast. Let's head for the high ground. I like your shirt. That's all. And Dunlop's battalion. And you're no longer double A's, and you're taking very you're taking heavy casualties. And remember, he is advancing on a very narrow front in a column, in a regimental column by company. So your line, if he has 300 men, divide 300 by by five. And you have how many men are in the line of battle. Because they'll be coming up by successive. So the Confederates can blast the first company, two companies to come up, and then blast the others as they come. And, they're, uh, and, the, and he will soon be falling back. And you can again why it's important to watch the field of battle. Because there you can see, now when Denson advances, the Confederates are going to have occupied those woods. When Bartlett advances, the Confederates are going to be in those woods there, and they're going to get frontal fire, and you're going to get flanking fire. And then the next time you're going to get in danger is when you cross that second ridge, and you're about 60 yards out, and not many are going to get that far. Right. <coughs> Congratulations, guys. You just reached your first objective. You were going for the high ground. And the tree line. The tree line and the high ground are not synonymous. This is not the primary Confederate line. Lyle's men are going to be moving through a draw on the other side of the road, which means they can't even see this field from their point of view. They can't see Hennigan's South Carolina Brigade, Nee Kershaw's old brigade, come forward, not only from the tree line, but up to this ridge. They're going to be able to form along this tree line with a regiment and fire right into the head of Lyle's column. But two other regiments are going to swing out across this valley, up to where we are, and fire down into the flank. And Lyle's brigade is going to be routed. We have a strong confirmation that the Confederate infantry is in fact here. <laughs> Lyle's men are going to vanish as fast as possible, running a gauntlet of fire. As they go back, they meet Warren, who will grab the flag of the 13th Massachusetts and beg the men to rally around him. What a remarkable change in a matter of a few minutes. A man who had been flippant about never mind bullets or cannon. We will have our breakfast. Now he's rallying the broken remnants of what was once a brigade. This is disastrous. The only way you're gonna recoup your reputation from the wilderness is to redeem yourself in Laurel Hill. The only way you can do that now, after losing Lyle, is to continue pitching in and do it quick and decisive. That does not give you the luxury at this moment to step back and reform a genuine battle line. He's gonna to continue to pitch brigades out here piecemeal to recoup the day reclaim the initiative, and save his reputation. Now, uh, when the next brigade is going to advance, 
Lyle has been repulsed. One of D Denson is now down to three regiments because one of his regiments had advanced with Lyle. He's going to pitch in, advance on company regimental column, company front, and they're going to get the furthest of anybody else. And that is going to be the 7th Maryland of, uh, of Denson's brigade. Denson will be shot in the left leg, the opposite leg from, uh, uh, from uh, Robinson, but he will not recover. Die. And you usually find Joshua Lawrence Chamberlain is not yet here. Uh, but they have a habit, if you like the 20th Maine, they have a habit of putting threes and Maine flags by the 7th uh, seventh Maryland, and that represents where Colonel Phelps reached, and that's the furthest any Union troops will reach that day or ever again at Laurel Hill. So they're going to be advancing on ground uh, to, to the rear of these guys' front. If those people turned around and looked that way, and you would uh, shift our line of advance over about 150 yards, and you would be moving along the line of advance of Denson. <laughs> Denson, of course, with the revolts of Lyle, have no one screening their left, and uh, Coulter isn't around. So Coulter had been held back. So that means the, uh, the next people to arrive are going to be the division commanded by Charles Griffin. And the next Union Brigade is going to advance is Bartlett's Brigade. Bartlett's Brigade is not going to get near as far as Denson because more and more Confederates are arriving and your each attack uh, will be like a wave going forward as the tide recedes, the waves do not go as high as they did in, as the more and more the Confederates will be arriving on the line. And this will keep up uh, all morning and into the early afternoon as Warren will repeat this method, method, uh, method of attack of throwing in brigades. He will go through uh, uh, in succession. Again, remember, and when they arrive, they attack and in the same formation, and the attack keeps moving in that direction, but unsupported. As we're going to talk about, uh, Bartlow will be next, and then Air, and then Schweitzer, and then Ayers, and then you're going into uh, a Cutler's division, because Cutler now commands Wadsworth's division, and you'll be getting the Iron Brigade thrown in. And the last of the troops to go arrive in the late after mid-afternoon are going to be Crawford's men, and he'll feed them in piecemeal on that side of the road. So Warren is not going to have a good day today, and he'll redeem it, he'll try to redeem himself even more disastrously towards the Federals on the tent. But that's in the future. Okay. <laughs> A good long streak quality is taking credit for everyone else's good work. <laughs> Joe Kershaw's guys are going to dig in here. And they're going to beat this back. Phelps falls wounded here. John C. Robinson, who lost his leg, is going to win the Medal of Honor. Not win the Medal of Honor, be a Medal of Honor recipient. Phelps. He's going to be a recipient of the Medal of Honor as well. After the war, Phelps purchases this piece of ground you're standing on and commissions this monument to be placed here. It's an interesting monument. It doesn't have any word of Phelps on it. But on the side of it, it has General Warren's admonition. Never mind bullets, never mind cannon. Now those are kind of haunting words in hindsight. What you're looking at is the first battlefield monument and the first piece of ground that has been preserved on this battlefield. And it was done by the Medal of Honor recipient, Walter Phelps.
a participant who gained glory here and also had his body disastrously hurt by being here. Obviously didn't kill him, he went on to a very fruitful and productive life in the legal system. Sitting at the bench instead of sitting in front of the bench. But this is something that was truly haunting and memorable to him. Important enough that he wanted it preserved and protected, not as the Phelps story, but as the Federal Advance story. One of those other wonderful, warming qualities of Medal of Honor recipients is the incredible selflessness that so many of them show. Phelps, in fact, is an ideal for that. So the federal attack has failed here because the Confederate line extends beyond their flanks and can fire into them. <coughs> we have failed on the Brock Road. We have now failed to the west of the Brock Road. The attacks will continue to move further afield of the Brock Road. Jeb Stewart has done a marvelous job at delaying the Union advance with Fitz Lee. He's done a marvelous job at assessing the situation and sending word back up the chain of command to get infantry here and to advise Lee of where the Army of the Potomac is. Confederates are en route. Lee is still 10 miles away as Anderson shows up on the field and assumes these wonderful lines. Jeb Stewart and Anderson will divide the responsibilities of defending it. In a sense, there is no cavalry commander and an infantry commander. There is no left-wing commander or right-wing commander. There are zone commanders. Basically, Anderson has what is fixed, and Jeb Stewart has what we are going to build. So he is constantly looking towards the future of this defense and expanding it, Anderson is looking at the perpetuation of what we have and consolidating it. That makes a wonderful synergy between the two of them. They work well under pressure. Federal commanders should take a lesson from that. This is probably Jeb Stewart's best day. It is definitely Richard Heron Anderson's best day. And it is Warren's worst though he will come up with much worse than this. <laughs> worse to date. Worse to date. But this is not also just Warren's fault. Where is Meade? Where is Grant? They are not here. The only responsible party here is Warren. Warren needs to be reinforced. We have gone from opportunity to almost near certain disaster. The momentum has swung on these trenches. The Confederates are the ones who are here in force. The Confederates may very well have the opportunity to sweep the broken remains of the Fifth Corps from this field. But that is hindsight. In the immediacy of every moment, soldiers are more inclined to see their own weaknesses than their own opportunities. And they assume that every one of their weaknesses is a glaring weakness, very evident to their opponent. <clears throat> the Confederates will not seize the initiative here until they have more troops, more <coughs> strength. The Federals will do very much the same thing. <coughs> Only difference is, Warren does need to stop. He's used up everything he has piecemeal and has utterly destroyed his core for this morning. He needs help. What about uh, ammunition for either side? How do they have that? Ammunition? What about ammunition for either side? There are wagon trains that are allocated specifically to each corps. There is also a general wagon train that we have talked about of that immense proportion of 5,300 wagons that shadows this army. Fifth Corps is not lacking for bullets. They're lacking for people to shoot the bullets and officers to direct where those bullets should go, when. The Confederates aren't hurting for bullets either. One of the great, uh, what I consider a myth, I can't speak for Ed, but I do, <coughs> is this idea that soldiers are always running out of ammunition, they never have it, Confederates are barefoot, barely have a couple of rounds. I have never seen a Confederate 
account where they left the field in mass because they ran out of ammunition. I've never seen a photograph of a Confederate captured that doesn't have shoes. So I think what we are differentiating between is Federals have ammunition. And when they shoot it away, they know they can replenish it almost instantaneously. Confederates have ammunition. But logistically, there is no guarantee that what is shot off now will be replaced in the next couple of minutes. Nonetheless, that, guarantee, that, that specter of lack of guarantee has been embellished in post-war memory into the idea that these guys, many of them are fighting without. Do they fight without? There are times, yes. Louisianans throw rocks at Second Manassas. But do the Louisianans lose their position because they have no ammo? No. So, ammunition is not the story here. I think that's a bit unfair to assign overcautiousness to uh, General Warren because that's an incredible responsibility when you're leading infantry in the van to throw everything in at once and not be connected to the rear with more infantry. And, uh, you know, it's, uh, it's, uh, I think it's uh, easier to see this in hindsight is, oh yeah, he threw everything in piecemeal. But like I said, it's, it's, it's an incredible responsibility. It's a lot of men you're in charge of. You want to take that one or you want to Well, the <laughs> enter into Warren's personality. As Frank has pointed out, he uh, is a, has a very hot temper. Uh, he, as an engineer, tends to be cautious. He had been cautious on the on the fifth, and it had got him in trouble. He had been criticized by both. His, support, uh, his superiors. Uh, he had been reamed out by one of his subordinates in front of his superiors. And uh, he has, uh, he has a, a problem, uh, he's a good, he probably would have been better off if he had say chief engineer of the army <laughs> rather than uh, being uh, leading troops, uh, he, uh, it's a lot more uh, to get ahead, to get publicity, leading troops, uh, the same way that in Vietnam, when they had a, a rotation party policy, everybody who wanted to get ahead in the army had to command a battalion in Vietnam, because otherwise, they're ca categorized as not real soldiers, or as they say, behind their back. And not in the Civil War, but then Donnelly did it in later wars, they're staff pukes. They're uh, people that are not real soldiers. How so uh, so uh, Warren uh, uh, suffers, I believe, somewhat from that. And we can see it again, and we don't want to get ahead today, uh, today, uh, uh, day, uh, on the tent. He gets up that morning and puts on his best uniform, belts on his both so his, his sword, that he is to cooperate with General Hancock. Hancock is having trouble extricating his men from south of the Po River, and the attack is, we're going to find out, is to be launched at 5 o'clock. Everybody is to attack at five o'clock. Warren will uh, take advantage of Hancock's absence to order the attack at four o'clock. His four o'clock attack <coughs> on uh, the uh, tenth will be no more successful than his series attacks on the eighth here. Uh, and Hancock will so that will result since he's attacked at 4 o'clock, by 5 o'clock his men have been repulsed. Hancock shows up with his big ego, and the Union now know that they're going to have to postpone the attack to uh, 6 o'clock. And when they postpone the attack to 6 o'clock, the attack will take place here at 6 o'clock, with Hancock in charge instead of Warren. 
Uh, also, Hancock has forgot that he's also responsible for Mott's division, which is going to be on the left of the uh, six of the six corps, and nobody will tell Mott that the command has been the attack has been postponed to uh, six o'clock, and Mott will attack at five o'clock and be repulsed uh, very easily by the Confederates. So we're going to find out when Upton breaks the line, he's going to look in vain uh, for Mott to come up. So uh, you can get uh, a lot of problems, and I think it plays out again that Warren uh, would hope to win the battle here and retrieve what has gone wrong on the, t on the 8th to him, what is his criticism he got on the, uh, <laughs> or his actions on the 5th by seizing this high ground. In fact, Meade, as we're going to find out by the time we get to Bethesda Church, Meade is the one who wants to release it. Uh, one. 